a lightning talk, okay, so it's quicker than all of the others. It was only billed to last for 10 minutes. Okay, so uh, the question really is um, nothing to do with uh, higher education institutions, but very much to do with education and learning. And it's about adult educators. So the focus here really is on um, adults who are learning for various reasons, and we'll say something about that in a moment, um, outside of uh, formal institutions. And, and the question is how far the open education movement is actually working for these people. Who's the guy with the beard and glasses in front of you at the moment? Well, uh, my name is Alistair Clark. I uh, have been an adult learning manager. I was senior program director at the National Institute for Adult Continuing Education, and I'm now a senior research fellow there. I'm an owner of a canoe, and my canoe is an open canoe. <laughs> There's two kinds of canoe. You can have a kayak, you can have an open canoe. Mine's an open canoe. Um, but in addition to all of that, I actually get out there and do some real teaching, and I teach a bit of French, teach a bit of maths, and I do some observation and classes for the Works Education Association. So I, I have a, 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 an interest in this at some, just about every level. Okay, it's a lightning talk, so there are six bolts from the blue. Um, who are these educators we're talking about, just to make sure we're clear there? Uh, what are they doing at the moment? I want to talk about Cliff. Nothing to do with the man who made the uh, We're All Going on a Summer Holiday song. It's a different Cliff. Projects in a box, over the cliff, and questions for us all. Okay. Um, can I just ask, are there people here who are actually involved in community adult learning? I know you are, aren't you, a bit? Yeah. There are several, several of you who are, right. Um, I think just for the benefit of people who may be involved in other sectors of education, um, this is a much more difficult to get hold of uh, group of learning deliberately because it's disseminated and it's very often delivered through all sorts of situations in the community. Um, the, the figures I'm going to give you are for England uh, because the funding and the management of this happens uh, in the different countries of the United Kingdom separately. But in England, it, it attracts a budget for the whole of England of uh, £220 million. But well, when you think there's about 30 million adults, it's not an awful lot of money to go around. So it's a relatively small budget, um, <clears throat> but um, it, 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 this is the kind of learning that can have a major impact on people's access to life chances uh, through the offering of good quality literacy, numeracy and IT skills courses. Um, the research would suggest that community learning can be extremely important for people facing life changes, whether it's a change of job or a change of family situation or preparing for retirement. So there tends to be a, a spike in people's in engagement uh, with, it, with our community learning when they're heading for a change in their lives. And the other thing is, it can be just bloody good fun and a wonderful way for people to actually strengthen the power of their own communities. And some of the research into the wider benefits of learning have suggested that whilst the learning is there, there are huge other benefits. Okay, I want to talk about a particular project which had a link with open educational resources. I had an initial flirtation with open educational resources, and I'd just like to take you through this story. Um, it, because I think there are things for me to learn from what you have to say about it, but I, I think the story may resonate at different levels with some of your experiences as, as well. This is the Community Learning Innovation Fund. This is Cliff. Um, and uh, it was established with £4 million across England in May two years ago, uh, and funded by the national agency that funds uh, <coughs> community learning, which is the Skills Funding Agency. The purpose of the fund was to go beyond that uh, 200 million and offer support for creative learning opportunities, particularly for disadvantaged people. So uh, it, was, it was something which my ex-organisation fought for very strongly, saying that actually um, we've got a programme out there, it's got a huge budget, but even that doesn't necessarily reach um, all of the people we want to be getting to. And um, we actually have Amanda sitting in the front row here who was one of the recipients of this money, weren't you? You were part of this project, well, not, not personally, but she was actually involved directly with it. Uh, so the project is called Cliff, and uh, there were actually a total of 97 projects that were funded across, the, across England, uh, and you can see the types of organisation that they came from, and the very largest group was from the third sector. 
uh, voluntary organization, 66 out of the 97 uh, came from, I'm my computer, um, uh, actually came from that sector. But then there was a spread, there were some universities, there were some FE colleges, there were some uh, housing associations, libraries, you can see it was got a, quite a range of organizations that got involved. And for those of you who are familiar with the distinction between formal education, non-formal, and informal education, have other people heard those terms? Some, some people have heard that. This is very definitely that in-between area of the non-formal. It's some structured learning, but happening in a very uh, non-traditional, informal location. Um, and the key thing was that this should be new and innovative and should reach people who weren't otherwise being reached. A small part of the project required all participants to share what they'd used afterwards. And they came to me and they actually said, why are we going to do this, Alistair? Well, we actually, I then suggested that we came up with this notion of a project in a box. A project in a box would be um, what you would need in terms of resources and information to take an idea that may be kicked off in Brighton and run it in Durham. Uh, you need to adapt it, but the, the, the project actually that had been funded was partly funded with the view to making it replicable. Um, this is one from Glossop. Does anybody know Glossop in Derbyshire? Yeah, know it there. Right, okay, it's just, just, just by the side of the uh, Kidless Scout over there. And this, I like this one, it's called uh, uh, Learning and Connecting Glossop Dale. And uh, I just think the picture is really rather nice of two, two rather wild, uh, less than young people on the back of a motor scooter. Um, but the, the point of this was to um, address the needs of older people and people with long-term chronic health conditions. And the aim was that they would develop new skills, gain confidence, and take part in their community through volunteering. All of the projects had uh, different target groups and different sets of outcomes, but they all had an educational element to them. And uh, Amanda's actually presenting yours tomorrow, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, which is in the afternoon? Oh, I think it's 11. 11. 11 tomorrow. So there's more detail about Amanda's. I've deliberately not shown those as the example here for that reason. Um, the idea of the project in a box really then translated into this. It, uh, it was, this is one of the better projects where they created the website um, there's a project outline, midway questionnaire, final questionnaire, personal plan for participants, training plan that they used on their July 17th event, flyer, volunteer session plan, and where am I now for participants. These were Word documents. These were not wonderfully complex, uh, not videos, they didn't get as far as that, they, they, they weren't necessarily interactive, they weren't flash, but they were licensed, and you won't be able to read the license but I'm going to read it to you because the creation of this material by the Volunteer Centre Glossop has been financed by the Skills Funding Agency through the Community Learning Innovation Fund managed by NICE. <laughs> Copyright in the material is basically in the crown, but it may be made available for others to use through um, the terms of an open government licence. Now, I wonder if there are people here who actually work with open government licences. Okay. What license would we normally suggest for something like this? Creative Commons. It's, it's just the OER world, isn't it? Creative Commons. Yeah. Um, they wouldn't have it. Now, in actual fact, uh, this is pretty much the same as a uh, attribution share of right license. But the difference is that it belongs to the Queen. Um, so the copyright goes to the Queen, whereas if you set up your own materials, you hold on to the copyright and you license it for other people to use. Um, I, I, I thought that this was um, perfectly acceptable in terms of sharing, but unhelpful in terms of people retaining ownership of what they created, particularly when there were small, struggling social enterprises, small community organisations, which I, I argue and failed to, to succeed, that they should actually be allowed to say it was theirs and for them to put the licence on it. But the report came out in January of this year, and it is no criticism when I, for, of the project when I say that in 100 pages there is one paragraph about the open licensing of the materials. I say this because we have to be realistic that, that wasn't, this was not an open education project. This was a project in which materials were intended to be made open. And it, 
was embedded within the project. But there were lots of other things that people were actually concerned about. Uh, but because there was only one line in the report, I've done my own. It's a very short one, and it came about as a result of a, sh a short online survey which I uh, did. Um, not, not a much larger group than Graham had for his, actually, so my stats, stats and it stand up respectively there. Um, but uh, we did it on SurveyMonkey, and we just asked people to give us some of their views on this new experience of actually sharing material. And, and this is the bit that I think may be really transferable, um, or, or, or maybe in contrast with your own experiences. Okay, so this is, the, this is just an example of the SurveyMonkey, and you can actually just get a little flavour of the first question, because the largest bar goes for, for I've never heard of open educational resources before. There were 19 responses. And in that, the largest group said, I've never heard of open educational resources, but after participating in CLIF, I understand the principle. So there was these three quarters of them said that. Um, one person knew about it before, or one per uh, two, sorry, two people knew about it before, two people had gone through the whole process and still didn't know what it was all about, but that's life, isn't it? Um, have to be realistic about communication. So that, that, I think, was a pretty successful outcome, really. Um, there's only a few questions. Only a few questions. Uh, when asked to make the products of your Cliff projects open for others to use, which of these best describes your reaction? And the largest was, we were happy to share our materials with others. Um, but a small number, I think one said, we're a small organisation with limited assets and we prefer to keep this material for ourselves. This lot in the middle might be, might be resonant with, with some of you. We're happy to share in principle, but our material was made for local use and wider audience may be critical. I think that idea that possibly selling later is interesting, because the reality is there's no chance of selling it later. No, there was no, there was no, there was, there was no market for it, but there was, there was people on very small budgets desperately trying to hang on to something they thought was an asset. Um, okay, as a community educator, are you aware, are you now aware of how to find OERs that you could use? And nine out of the 19 said that they were, but 10 still didn't know. It wasn't specifically a, a project which required them to go out and find about OERs, but it raised their awareness. And so there are still more in this survey, in this group, half of the group who uh, don't really know where to find stuff. Um, as a community educator, are you aware of how to license any materials that you make in the future? Six said yes and 13 said no. My argument was that if we'd have given them the responsibility to do the licensing as part of the funding, then they'd have gone through that process and learned how to do it. So that was a bit disappointing. Uh, this is my big one. In the Cliff programme, there was a requirement for the funding that you marked your materials copyright vested in the Crown. Um, how did you feel about that? So, the f one person said, I didn't consider licensing to be important enough to spend any time on. Couldn't be bothered with it. And I think there are people like that. That's a reality, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> this group here said, which was uh, seven, I was aware of the requirement, but would have preferred to keep the copyright for our organisation, but would have been happy to make the materials available. And then an equal number said, I was aware of this. I was quite content to give the copyright to the Crown. Um, and there were two people at the bottom, although it was one of the rules of the funding, they hadn't even clocked it. Um, but I think, I think that's quite interesting. There were some people who didn't, didn't actually mind whether they owned the copyright, but there was at least half of them uh, um, who had a view there who actually would have preferred to have said, this is ours and we're now making it available. Um, this is about adapting materials, and uh, again, we've got uh, slightly nine who don't know how to adapt materials, and eight who do. Um, this is my shorthand conclusion. Uh, the people at the beginning were aware of it fairly, uh, of much of the view that, that this was a good idea, um, and they wanted to do the right thing, but they still don't know what that right thing is. Um, so, my questions as laid down in the paper were, was this a bold move which was effective in sharing resources? Did the requirements for content sharing raise commitments of participants to open education? And, or was the open government license an appropriate tool? Um, 
So there's that. But more importantly, really, for you, uh, what can you take from this experience and what strategies could be adopted in this case to advance open educational practice? So is there anything you take from this experience? Does any of this resonate for people here? Or does it feel like a different world? Um, no, it, it's, uh, I sort of lived through the OER programs from JISC and yeah. you know, in that there were people who didn't know anything really about sharing or licensing and they went through similar journeys to yours now. I'd say maybe at the end of it more people knew about the licensing and there's more information on that. Sure. Um, but still, still people who are still having trouble um, sharing, still were interested in making money out of sharing by the end of it. So, yes, it's, it's a similar story. It feels, it feels like quite familiar. Yeah. Uh, and the GIST program, I mean, the GIST funding program, we asked in over several years. Yeah, and we're going to ask about this one. Well, there's no funding. There is an, an informal network, and I'm probably one of the people who stirs it up by sending the messages from time to time. So you've managed to maintain the network of people from this project that still interested in this work. Well, they're part, they're part of the but they, they no longer have a funding. You know, the contractual commitment. But they're still Some are. Well, you know, a good, a good third of them responded, you know, a, a year after the funding yeah, to, my, to my circle. Um, any, any other reactions to, to this as an experience here? Yeah. I think if you take into account a constructivist approach to understanding open educational resources and, and licensing, which you are going to be by creating it and integrating it within the whole process, yeah, sure. then I think that's the way to do it. I mean, my experience is getting people to understand creative commons is actually for them to create something or to use something. And then as part of that process, you get to understand the licensing rather than saying these are the licenses, um, which you obviously did. You took them through that process of understanding the differences and the ownership and associated with it. I think the thing with Creative Commons is people sometimes don't understand that actually they retain the copyrights, and their license and somebody needs to do that. So you're actually protecting yourself and protecting them, um, and that, that is a very straightforward thing to understand. I think. The complicated bits of the various elements about what we lose and what we don't lose according to what the issue you, you apply. But I think if your best way um, in any learning and teaching approach is for you to actually find it in your own practice and then you understand it, the people that haven't engaged with what they have not really applied it or thought about it. Uh, and those are the people that are actually in more dangerous positions because they put themselves in the middle of the yeah. Well, the sustainability aspect, I mean, there's quite a common theme in the those come off as in the city of Five and Camp. Um, it's not necessarily the sustainability of creating OER, it's actually the sustainable philosophy of engaging with OER, which, which that possibly will happen. So if they're not creating the content, they are actually thinking about that in that context. I mean, I, I, I don't think it's job done, but I, mean, I think the, the, you know, the appetite is wet. And uh, I, I won't steal Amanda's fun, but only to say that she's going to be taking this stage further tonight and looking at the, uh, the ownership of the material created by learners themselves. I think that's, that's a really interesting yeah. I think as well, um, I, I don't know Yeah, 
you know, and then you get another layer of the onion, which might be for people who are um, developing the product, if you like, and, and, and they're often a bit more removed. And, and you know, so I think there's, there's um, complexities to this, um, which we really kind of have to get into. And I totally agree with that whole thing of people learn this by, by doing it. Yeah. Um, but they don't actually know what they need to learn. You know, well, that's that. Sense. Unconscious incompetence. Um, there's dangerous things that the canoeing is a fairly dangerous thing that I do. But standing between people and their coffee break is even worse. And it's certainly annoying to that. It would be the bad thing to do. Um, I, I, my other consultancy is called Stirring Learning, and there's more information about this on the blog, Stirring Learning. So thank you very much. Thank you.